Um, welcome everybody. Okay, uh, today we have a special lecture. In fact, is the opening lecture uh, of this semester. As you know, the new model of the school uh, implemented by Josep Ferrando as a new dean of the of the School of Architecture, uh, and uh, there is a, a cycle of of lectures uh, related about each semester. And of course, the, the opening ones, and that in fact is not the first, but is the opening one, uh, is the, the um, for the studio that is the visiting professor. Okay, in this case, we have today the pleasure to be with us, uh, Olga Felipe and Josep Camps. Okay, both of them they have uh, an studio uh, called Architecturia. Uh, hope uh, well known for all of you. And of course, I today we will begin a new format also of presentations because all of you, you can share your image. So please, I will ask you that many of you, please turn on the cameras, not the micros, but yes, the cameras. So then the, the lecturer uh, has not the feeling that is talking alone with the, with the screen. So thank you very much to be here and to share with us uh, this opening lecture of this semester. Uh, and uh, remember that at the end, okay, you can ask uh, questions or do comments, or whatever, uh, to Olga Philippe or Josep Camps. And uh, of course, if you don't have microphone, I will read it. But if you have the microphone, so you can turn on and you can talk directly to him. So it will be, it will be better and fresher for all of us. So thank you very much, uh, Olga, Josep, to be here. It's a pleasure for us uh, to have you here. And uh, well, as you know, this is part of the of the visiting unit, uh, led by by Ricardo de Besa. So Ricardo, uh, please uh, can you introduce us, Olga, Felipe, and Josep Camps, uh, and then uh, we will have the lecture. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to all of you. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Pedro, for, for the introduction. And as you were mentioning, uh, this semester, the visiting unit guest professor are Olga and Josep. With them, I have the lucky to, to teach to our students. And this course is quite experimental since we're working in how to deal with the injury after the exploitation of some quarries here in, in Catalonia. And we approach it to the project from the complexity of the territory, its landscape, the resources, and extractive techniques. Uh, the recovery of such wounded environments is proposed from ephemeral programs with the claim that in a long term the quarries can recover and as a renaturated places. I mention it that because it's, it's a very um, clear introduction how Architecturia Organ Josep is, is working also in, in, in their own studio. No? Um, in that sense, let me introduce briefly, Arquitecturia is an office based in Girona, founded by Olga, Felipe and Josep Camps, as I was mentioning, focused on urban, cultural, residential, educational and sanitary projects for both public and private sectors. Besides their work as a practitioner, they, also, they are also teaching, researching and taking part in cultural promotion and devotion on, on, as a post director of some architectural associations. Since 2006, they have won several awards and their work has been recognized, published and exhibited worldwide. In, in fact, in 2013, they received the Young Architect and the Year by the Building Design and Olga Felix was awarded by the Architects Journal as the Emerging Woman in Architecture. Their buildings are designed quite simply and forced full lines. In their construction, they usually use very few materials and they put attention mainly to create clean, clear and great spaces repeating few architectural elements. I think it's quite um, this is straightforward and, and a very clear approach from home, from how they are doing, dealing with the, with the architecture. Um, some of the more remarkable works are the Cultural Center of Ferrerias in Tortosa or the Museum of Energy and NASCO, together with many singular housing projects and many others which are ongoing right now. So I am very pleased to introduce them. And, and again, Olga, Josep, welcome. And thanks again for giving us the opening lecture of this semester. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo, for the introduction. And thank you 
to Joseph and Pedro for the invitation to this lecture. So should I start? I, okay, so I'm going to share the screen. Just let me know if everyone can see it properly. Um, Just yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, can you see it well? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. So, so just to start, um, I guess that all of us have these kind of small obsessions that somehow um, frame the world, how we are seeing it, uh, how we are approaching it. And I would say that in our case, our small obsession is what we call verso and reverso. So what does this mean? I mean, talking about reversibility in architecture means that in and out are, let's say, two different realities. So we understand inside and outside as verso and reverso. They are discontinuous and reversible. So, but at the end, one comes to be present in, in the other. So just as I said, I mean, when, when you have this kind of small obsession, suddenly, you start seeing it everywhere. So I'm just going to run through some examples of this kind of concept in different uh, films or pieces of art uh, along the history. So for example, um, Vivre Savi. Vivre Savi is the film by Jean-Luc Godard from 1962, where actually I would say that more than a film is a collection of scenes and images where Jean-Luc Godard shows and makes visible the montage technique. So the film is set in 12 chapters, but what I would say that it is even more amazing about this film is how Godard plays with the audience. So for example, this is a capture of the first scene where we are seeing Nana, who's the main actor, and she, she, she's breaking up with uh, her partner, which is just sitting next to her. But what Godard does is that he lets you hear the conversation, you can listen, but you cannot see. I mean, he holds you and you can just see, you know, the face of Nana just from the reflection in, in the mirror. So I, in somehow, Godard makes you feel like a voyeur and it really captures your attention and seduces you. Godard defends quite strongly that there is a clear difference between the interior which hides the soul and the exterior, the face, which is our expression. And those two walls or complementary realities, sometimes they get confused. Like for example, happens in the Palladio Olympic Theater um, where one is immersed in an ideal wall. And when you prospect into the inside, what you discover is the imagined city, is really what it is, is an exterior inside an interior. Or for example, when Alexander von Humboldt in his exotic adventures in the early 19th century, he illustrated this book, Geography of Plants, where he overlapped complementary realities. So the perception of the eye is overlapped to the knowledge of the reason, a collection of terms of words uh, in a very precise position in your right and the perception of the eye on your left. So here von Humboldt maps by the biodiversity in this idea of order and diversity. Or for example, a last case, the, the dream by Rousseau, where the presence or the super position, let's say, or overlap of the domestic is overlapped in this wild wall, the jungle. And then Rousseau makes you wonder, are we in front of uh, an exterior or is it an interior? So the magic of this ambiguity is that it opens a window. It opens a window to the audience to have a thought and interpret their reality. So Verso and reverso are these two different realities and at the same time they are complementary. In our studio we really believe in this double world and we believe in, in that discontinuity between the inside and outside, imagining architectures which from the distance or from the outside they are not revealed instantly. 
one gradually approaches and discovers its interior. We approach architecture in this way, all along the process from the concept to the detail, from the analysis of the context to the materiality, always work, working with many layers. So having said this, now I will just go through some works and some projects of our studio. So I will start with five build works. The first one is actually one of our very first projects, which is the cultural center in Ferrarias. Ferrarias. <laughs> you put that on the accent. So the project uh, to recover the, the market of Ferrarias as a cultural center, uh, as I said, it was one of our very first projects. And actually this market was built in the 60s in a neighborhood of Tortosa, which is called Casas Baratas, let's say cheap houses, because um, it, all this neighborhood was built with uh, very few resources using the typical brick of, of the area. And the building had been in disuse for many decades. Uh, his physical and social environment had been transformed over the years, but the market stayed there abandoned uh, as a background. So I remember that once we had on the competition, the town council asked us if we thought that it was worth preserving the building or if we thought that it would be better just to turn it over and build a new one. And I remember that we decided to preserve it because of mainly three reasons, I would say. First of all, because the market for many years had been part of the background of the daily life of this neighborhood. And we believe that there was a kind of expectation from the citizens to recover it. Secondly, because the area, as I said, ha has a kind of, as a whole, has a kind of, um, let's say, own constructive character. So most of it is built with this kind of very special brick of, of the area. So we thought that it was important not to weaken this character of, of the neighborhood. And finally, because actually we, we kind of consider ourselves as collectors, um, which means that we are very interested in objects that have been taken out of their functional concept. And in this case, we were in front of a market that was no longer a market. The existing building, this is the plan, the floor plan of the existing one. So as you see, it was a cross plan with a central nave, side chapels, and accesses from three of the four facades. The scheme showed a clear intention of an isolated building, but as you see, it was strangely attached to the dwellings uh, on one of these corners. Also between the market and the square just beside it, there was these storage areas. We can see it better in this picture. Um, that actually um, didn't let this access from the public space. So there was really no relation between the market and the main nave and the public realm, which was just beside it. So one of the first decisions was to demolish these um, storage spaces and to place the extension in and the main entrance of the building in this place. Oops, sorry. So here we see, I mean, how we placed this uh, extension just in between, uh, in the place of the storage, just in between the, the market, the nave of the market and the public realm. So also the original market was placed just a little bit high in a high position from the ground, I mean, from the street because of the flats. And also, I mean, with this intervention and placing the, the access in this position, it let us solve a question of accessibility through the design of the public realm. So we intentionally search for a certain tension between the new and the old in this kind of temporal overlap between what is part of our memory and what is the vibrant contemporary living and what it means. The intervention in the existing building was looking really for its main character. In this case, the emptiness 
of the central nave. So we avoided to place um, the strong programmatic functions in the main nave to emphasize this kind of empty character of the original state of the nave, as well as <clears throat> emphasizing the natural light. So starting from the grid of the original grid, we set relations with the, with the extension. And here in the floor plan, we see how from the entrance, the main, the, the main new entrance placed in the extension, we kind of organize the space around the empty nave so that it could be used in many different ways. So actually, um, this area here let us enter in many different space, I mean, from many different positions. And this space on the other side led for storage on maybe the dressing rooms. So at the end, this kind of setting led this kind of multifunctionality of, of this space. So inside, I mean, again, with this idea of uh, the interior, the verse and reverse as interior and exterior with which are complementary but discontinuous, um, we see how inside of the nave, by the day, the space is bright and ethereal, and the old facade actually comes to be present in the inside. While at night, it, the interior is completely silent, is opaque, heavy, and quite tight. And from the outside, it happened just the opposite. So the facade during the day, it's opaque and mute, while in, when it gets dark, it becomes permeable and, re and reveals its interior. So we explore the materiality and its expression through the repetition. So from basic units, we establish assembly systems, industrialized elements that are applied handcraftly that forms this kind of textures and permeable surfaces. So for example, in the inside, we're using the timber um, with uh, sticks, let's say, with this four by six, while in the exterior, actually, we're using kind of the same modules, but with the folded steel sheets. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Museum of Energy in NASCO. In this case, the SCO nuclear plan wanted to build this um, kind of small museum where they could explain the production of energy and also set a kind of reception area for conferences and meetings. So in this case, the, the Museum of Energy had to be located just beside the power nuclear station in this kind of uh, condition in the border of the River, um, Ebra River. <laughs> so from the very beginning, I remember that the client told us that there was a kind of important uh, issue for, for the power plant, which was that at the end of the uh, exhibition promenade, they wanted to have this kind of direct view to the power plant. So, and this could be discovered at the end of the exhibition. So here we see, I mean, in these diagrams, how this kind of um, idea is set. So actually the, the power plant has this double fence that we see here. And there was this idea of receiving the visitors, showing the exhibition, and then at the end of the kind of promenade to frame and show this direct view towards the power plant. And I have to say that one of the challenges probably of this project was the amazing industrial scale of the power plant. So actually when you are there, one really feels very small. So actually one of the challenges of the project was how to deal actually with, with this amazing industrial scale and also not only industrial, but also of the landscape. So we started from a square, 42 by 42, uh, and we set this regular grid that actually modulates and organizes the program and interior spaces. So from this scheme, the square is divided in two sides. The one 
that actually is the outside that is the one that receives the visitor and then the inside one that is the one that frames the views toward the, the power plant. So this would be the image of this kind of corp that is receiving the visitor and then the second core, this kind of subtraction that frames the views toward the um, power plant. You can see the window here on the top level where you have this direct view to the power plant. And in between, between receiving and framing the content of the exhibition is shown. So the square, as I said, is divided in two sides in the interval or this French in between is where all the services and communications are organized. And then we have on one side, the receiving space with the um, auditorium, let's say. And in the other side, we have the temporary exhibitions. When one gets to the upper plan, uh, upper floor, then on this promenade of coming up, you discover the river Ebra. Uh, Ebra. Actually, it's the only point where you can directly see the landscape, actually. And then uh, the final part of the permanent exhibition and, and the views to the power plant. So the grid, which at first was very regular and abstract, once is overlapped on site, then the distortion happens. So in some way, we could say that the museum anchors to the site and establish this close relation with the forerunners. As you can imagine, the power plant has very high levels of security. So um, this set a kind of premise when thinking about the constructive systems and how we will, would build the, the museum. So we propose to work just with dry construction systems and with the minimum numbers of manufacturers. So we propose the same system, uh, same constructive system for roof and facade, which are both dry systems produced at the workshops and then just brought and fixed on site. So we started with the steel structure and the same system for the facade and the roof. And we thought about also combining two dry systems for the facade, which was the, the, the perforated folded steel sheets for the regular perimeter combined to the curved surfaces uh, of polycarbonate. So we were combining again the fine light and ethereal material, materiality of the polycarbonate with the rough and dark materiality of the folded and perforated fold, uh, folded yeah, sheets of, sorry, steel sheets. <laughs> so the combination of these two systems actually responded to this kind of action of subtraction that forms the first space of reception and also the exterior space at the end of the journey that frames the views toward the power plant. Um, on 2012, um, the swimming pools of Jesus um, were one of the nine works that was selected to be part of the architectural rovers exhibition that represented the Catalonian pavilion at the Venice Biennale. So I remember that the curators asked each of the nine teams to think and to produce an object that was related to the work, to the, in our case, the swimming pools, but not literally. So the swim, the, it's an exterior swimming pools and these swimming pools are placed um, just between the road and the landscape. So this, the road that connects two towns, Jesus and Roquetas, and just in front of this, Ebra River again, <laughs> the River Ebra landscape. So in this case, the strategy of the project is to set a kind of clear boundary between this road and the swimming pool space protected from the traffic and the strong wind and open to the landscape of the olive trees, orange and lemon trees of the River Ebro. Ebro. So 
the facade, which may seem very opaque from the distance. When you get closer, you start discovering that it is permeable and actually you discover some points where you can actually have a direct view to the inside of the swimming pools and discover what the life that is happening inside. So when thinking about the object, we thought of an stereoscope. Um, I don't know if you know what's a stereoscope. Uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, um, when traveling was something very rare, uh, there were lots of new gadgets and inventions and machineries that appear like panoramas, kinetophones, and also stereoscopes, which the aim of these kind of gadgets was to approach these far realities to the audience. And actually a stereoscope is a, an object that um, creates a kind of optic illusion and just taking pictures from a very exact precise distance and setting them in the distance of the eye of the audience or the viewer, you create a kind of three-dimensional effect. So just like in the swimming pools from the distance, we imagine that this may seem a quite strange object that you really don't know if it's watching you or if it's you that is kind of watching it. Um, but when you come closer and looked inside, then what you may discover is the real life of the swimming pools. So we had to produce the object ourselves. And actually, Sebastián, who is a great uh, craftsman, helped us. And at the end, um, what we did is actually five stereoscopes. So actually it was kind of five windows that opened and showed this kind of five fragments of life and scenes of, of the swimming pool. So you actually became a voyeur, someone that actually was spinning and gazing the real life of the swimming pools. And I'm just going to, um, this is not the last one, the, there's one more, but um, I'm just, this actually is the last work that we have finished quite recently, which is the new law courts uh, of the city of Tortosa. So Tortosa, it's um, a city that can, can be understood as a superposition or overlap of fortifications and walls that have been kind of built over the years and its history. And the city is actually the, the River Ebra again, crosses the city in two sides. So on the left, we have the flatland, let's say, and on your right, the right of the River Ebro, there's this kind of hills where actually we can find all these fortifications and city walls. So in this case, the site of the new law courts was in this position, just next to the cathedral and the main castle on the top of the hill. You can see here a bit the landscape and the fortifications, but what's most I would say that the main character of this old quarter probably is the color, the chromatic and the stone and, and the light that it has. So we had had a previous experience in, in the old quarter with this. Our, actually, this was our first build work, which is the abscess square just next to the cathedral. Um, if I go back quickly, you'll see. So this is the cathedral. This is the, the abscess square that we built uh, some years ago. And one of the main obsessions that we had with this project was to try to match this kind of materiality and chromatic of the old quarter. So here we were working with concrete and we actually were working with, we look for sand and the material of, of the rocks of the area just to have this concrete with the same chromatic and tone uh, of the cathedral and the old quarter. So I would say that this set a premise, a principle for the project of the law course as one of the first decisions was that we would kind of work with this continuity and materiality and extend this idea of working with, with concrete. 
um, the site, the shape of, of the site was very, um, I would say, irregular, uh, which was a challenge in terms of when you're working with law courts, the, there's the brief or the program. It's very complex in the sense that um, there's this kind of circulations that cannot be crossed. So you cannot mix the public or the user with the judge and you cannot mix it with the um, witness or the other persons or prisoners. No, so there's this complexity about the circulations and and the program, and this added a kind of challenge or complexity to the project when we are we're facing this irregular shape uh, of the of the site. So the strategy basically was to place all the kind of offices and more smaller kind of part of the program on the most regular and lineal facade. Um, while we would place all the circulations and, and public areas in the other side where actually there were direct views to the cathedral and, and the castle. While we had the multifunctional space that would be in the middle, letting us, helping us to lead with this kind of two different programs and conditions. So here we see the, the one of the main floor plans where we see all the offices just facing this actually very narrow street while we had the circulations the main stairs and all these kind of waiting areas just facing these views toward the old quarter and as i was saying here there was this first decision about working with concrete 100 percent, but we had this other challenge which was the kind of different uh, levels and topography that we had to deal with. So the strategy was to basically um, use the kind of in situ concrete for the first level and from then and on to use the prefab uh, systems. And here there are some samples where we were kind of looking the perfect tone that could match the, the chromatic of, of the old quarter. And here again, we were kind of rehearsing the different tones and the different geometry of, of this kind of prefab module that would help us to deal with the different situations all along the facade. Uh, so we started uh, the main, the smaller kind of office was the three meters wide. So actually we decided to use a module of one meter, which uh, divided in these eight parts gave us this kind of interval of uh, 12 and a half. And with this strategy of with this one meter module, let's say we were solving every and each situation that we were facing. So from the corner to the um, opaque, to the windows or the spaces where, where, where we were looking for wider views when we had the um, waiting areas. So in this image, we see the, the facade of the offices, the narrower street. And here, what I, I think that we can see better what I was trying to explain before of this combination of the, of the in situ concrete just to solve the this question of topography um, combined to the prefab modules of the same concrete. And in, in this corner, actually, we can see it even better, this kind of topography condition and how it also merges and shows up the, the main entrance to the building in the corner. And this, um, now we are going to change scale. So this is um, one of the last works of this first series that I'm showing, which is the, um, tell you an artist, the studio for an artist. So in this case, um, this artist um, was living with his parents and he had, I mean, it was a house, an isolated house in a garden. And he couldn't paint, he couldn't work at home. So he asked us to build a small studio in the garden so that he could, you know, he could work 
but could kind of forget that he was at home. So here the, the challenge was that um, we had to build this 60 square meters studio in this garden and we had a very tight budget, but also we had very short time to, because I mean, they wouldn't move from the house. So we had to build it while they were living there. So here, one of the challenges was how to deal, you know, with this situation. So, um, so this is the house, it's an L-shaped house. And there is in the garden, there is this amazing ash tree, which, actually was one of the principles that we wanted to preserve it. So the strategy basically was about uh, placing the studio in the corner of the garden and try to work with this kind of cross typology so to preserve the ash tree, but also try to frame the corners of, of the garden. So when you would be in the studio, you wouldn't see the house at all. Um, so starting from the cross shape, we um, organize a kind of double space in the middle where is the main space where he paints and organizes like four different spaces around it. One is this table where he's showing his pieces, uh, his works, a small space to stay, uh, kind of rest and um, storage and wet area, let's say. And here we see the, the scale and the relation between the space where he paints in this double scale and the ice tree. So in this view from the inside, we see how actually the house is just behind this corner. So with this strategy of the cross shape, he would be painting in this double space and would have views to the edges to the corners of his garden, but wouldn't see, wouldn't perceive the existence or the presence of, of his house. And from the outside, probably, I mean, you can clearly read that there's this condition of being in a corner of the garden. And here, the strategy again, the constructive strategy to solve or achieve this challenge was a decision about working 100% in wood. But in this case, uh, we would be working with three different carpenters. So we modulated all the pieces in this kind of two and a half by five or five by five, always a combination of these two numbers. And um, we solved, I think I have a picture later. Well, I'm just wondering, yeah, here. So, yeah, so one of the carpenters was um, building, was manufacturing all the structure. Another one would be manufacturing the, um, the, uh, the cladding and the other one, the inside cladding again. And I'll just go back because I found very through, but we can see here the, the space and the relation with the ash tree. Yeah. Okay, so, so now I'm going to go through uh, four domestic um, buildings, so, so four houses. Four houses that um, they have a very similar uh, urban context, let's say. So they are all isolated uh, houses with, you know, the same similar um, separa separation, um, distance to the, to the neighbors, distance to the street um, and kind of height, you know? So we have the same kind of regulations for all these typologies, but you will see how there is a kind of evolution in the typology of these four houses, um, especially on the relation between the inside spaces and, and the gardens. And also uh, most of them have a similar structural system with wood panels, but then also again, we're playing in different ways in terms of materiality. So the first one 
house, we call it O9. Um, it's um, a house which is very compact. So it's a two stories house, um, which actually is, um, it's in this plot, which is set in, this is a corner actually. And it's a very compact house, which is facing the four sides of the garden, establishing a different relation with each of the sides of the garden. So starting again with the grid, um, we divided the grid in two sides again, and an interval in the middle where would solve the entrance to the house, but also the, um, the vertical circulation with the two story, in between the two stories. So from the upper road, we have the access of the, of the car and from the side road, we have the pedestrian access. Here, um, as I said, there's this interim space, which is dividing the house in two sides, the one with the garage and the studio facing this north part of the garden, and the one which is kitchen, living and, and dining room, which is facing the southern part of, of the garden. And on the upper level with the same um, kind of disposition of the pieces, um, the, in, the interim, the middle space kind of has the, the, the staircase with the patio. And then on the upper part where we have two bedrooms sharing a bathroom and the principal room in the other side. And in this case, as I said, we were using the wood panels structure and combining two different materials, uh, which was the um, burned wood and the copper. So in this case, we chose two different materials, which actually are, we can say that are alive in the sense that they change their, they change uh, with the time. So what's happening now is that this was a picture of the house when we had just finished, where we can see the cooper very shiny and reddish. And the um, burned wood was super intense black. Um, and now, which mm, we finished the house some couple of years ago, what happened is that this contrast between the two materials have actually approach to each other. And now the uh, wood has kind of lost, lost uh, its intensity to a grayish. And the, the cooper has also lost a bit of its shine to a more brownie and matte kind of. So now they are kind of getting closer to each other. And probably toward the time, and as time passes by, they will keep changing. So the relation between the both will keep changing over time. And the image of the entrance of the porch of entrance. I don't have current images, but I think it would be nice to incorporate it because it's nice to see how they, these two materials are changing over the time. Um, so the next one, as I said, is a similar condition, a similar urban condition, but here we started to atomize the program. So each of these pieces, you will see later when I show the floor plan, kind of house different parts of the program and their shape and their size and their height responds to the program that they are kind of housing. So for example, the volume that's facing the street, this is a view from the road, from the street, sorry. So the first volume has this double height, which uh, houses the entrance and the studio on top, which kind of receives you, but also gives uh, more intimacy to the rest of the, of the house and the garden. So in this model, kind of we were testing the position and the relation of the, each of these pieces to each other. And all of these four pieces are placed just around this main patio in the center. So they have this double relation in between them, looking to this inside patio, but at the same time, having setting these kind of corners the rest of the garden. 
Again, we set the grid. And in the floor plan, you can see how this very first one, which is the one that has the two stories and a higher level, holds a small library and the studio on top. The second one, which is maybe the larger one in, on plan, is the living room, uh, kitchen, and dining room. And then the two others, which have the same size, all, each of them houses um, a bedroom, the uh, bathroom, and a small studio, in this case, and a dressing room in the other case. So each of these pieces relates to this patio inside through a window and then establish a kind of their own relation with the garden that's outside. So this is a view of one of these view of, of these windows that it's kind of a piece of furniture. In Catalan, we can of course place this festejador. <laughs> And also the expression of, of this kind of window, which is a space itself and relates, establishes this kind of relation between the inside and the outside, framing the views to the patio. And in between the pieces, there's these small corridors which connect each of the kind of um, volumes which actually we wanted to play with this idea of confusing about if it has an interior or an exterior character. So this is a view of one of these corridors around. And again, here we were working with the wood panel structure that closed each of the boxes and working just with uh, aluminum for the outside facades. Um, working with different typologies of, of windows. So we established like three different relations. The one that was 100% open to the outside, the one that had the, the folded um, perforated steel, and the one that was kind of mixed. And here we see the, the kind of relation between the two volumes through these kind of glass corridors. And actually what's been surprising is that the, um, the woman that lives in this house started to have a kind of um, amazing passion for gardening. And actually now the garden has become a kind of lab of species. So each and every corner has a kind of different character just working with the species, the different species. And the next one is kind of a similar exercise of atomizing the, the brief and the program. But in here, if before we saw that the relation between each of these volumes um, with, was direct to the garden and direct to each other, between each other, in this case, we will see how the relation between each of the elements with the courtyard inside and in between them is through a main element, a kind of cloister. So we see it better here. So again, in this case, the size and the, and the volume, let's say, of each of the um, elements uh, responds to the program that is housing. Um, so in this case, we have uh, each of the bedrooms is responds to one of these. Uh, in this case, uh, this bedroom and this is the, the bathroom and the bigger one is uh, the living, dining and kitchen. And each of these elements connect to this kind of cloister or corridor around the inside courtyard. So the main entrance, so you access from this point discovering the courtyard and then from this corridor you kind of access to each of the elements. And in this case, this is very usual in our studio. So once we've set the, read the context, we kind of understood, you know, the, the brief deeply. We work with the grid and the kind of typology. We, in parallel, we kind of work of this, 
three different kind of questions, but also we did this, do this kind of exercise. So we start testing and modeling, opening a wide range of shapes and possibilities. And then we start cutting it up, trying to find the one that best works and deals with the rest of the elemental components of the architectural process. So in this case, we open up kind of range of shapes for as we wanted to look for this kind of expression of the roof. And we ended up developing this one on the left. So at the end, we ended up developing this kind of double steep roof coming inside. And here again, um, we had this kind of premise that we want to, to work with, with the wood, but at the end, just developing further the project, we ended up setting kind of two layers. So there's um, a kind of more grounded layer, which is um, soft uh, on in situ concrete. And then the second one, which is this kind of um, tapiro flex roofs um, made with wood. So these are some pictures of the works on site with the, the concrete walls. And now we are just, I mean, the, the roofs are starting to come on site. And also um, we are working in this project with Kumella, the ceramist. Um, to solve the uh, cladding of, of, the, of the roof. So we are kind of searching for the color, let's say of, of this kind of greenish roof. And the last one, the last one of this series, the last house that I'm going to explain is I would say it's kind of the end of the process of this evolution that I was telling about the relation between the inside spaces and, and the garden. So in this case, probably we could say that um, the garden is the house itself. Um, so in this case, this is the plot and this is the maximum that can be built uh, with the distances to neighbors. And the strategy in this case was to kind of uh, build as much as we could. So to, to complete all the perimeter, the buildable perimeter of the house to try to, to to try to gain the maximum patio or the maximum open air area in the middle and in the inside. So again, from the grid, we, I mean, the, the house all turns around and develops all its program around a main patio. So from, from the dining and living spaces to the more intimate spaces, they all happen around the main courtyard. So here in a more precise uh, floor plan, we see how um, on the top level, we see, uh, top part, sorry, we see the kitchen, living, dining room, opening small windows, very strategic windows um, on the perimeter, but most of it just facing um, the main patio, which actually we could say that it's a garden. The house is, is a garden, is understood as a garden itself. Um, again, here we were working with this system of models, just trying to shape, and we ended up with this kind of curved inverted cone that focused kind of um, all the main um, attention to, to the open air patio. So this is a view, and also this house is already um, under construction. In this case, um, We've used uh, actually the, the, the man that's going to live in this house is the one that's building the house. So it's, it's been a very tight relation between him and us as we are, it's kind of out of construction. So in this case, um, he has a great knowledge about steel. So there was this kind of principle about working 100% in steel. So the structure is developed all by himself in steel. And the cladding um, also is kind of um, doing this kind of waving steel sheet shape, also solving the different conditions of the windows 
And this is a, a visit of the studio to a side visit of the studio. Okay, so now I'm going to start with the last um, series of projects, which is going to be a first is a master plan and then I think four or five, I don't remember, we'll see, <laughs> competitions. Um, so I would say that this project, the, the Four River Master Plan in Girona, set a kind of, um, I don't know how to say it in English, it's uh, inflection. Well, I don't know if this word exists in English anyway, but it was a kind of very important uh, highlight. No, I don't know how to say it anyway. I, I guess you know what I mean. But for the studio, it was a kind of, um, experience and probably changed the way how we used to look at cities. So this uh, Four River Master Plan actually started from a question of uh, that the town council said about how can we approach uh, the citizens of Girona to its four rivers. Um, so the, the master plan is all about this. It's about how to recover the relation between Girona and its four, city, uh, its four rivers. So at the very beginning, Girona was a city that was set at the very high level um, in, on a hill, far away from the floods of the rivers. But the city expanded over the years and started occupying the borders of, of the rivers. Um, although many activities were happening, like the marketplaces, for example. So at the very beginning, what happened is that the main entrances to the city were always just beside and along these main rivers. And, but later on, with the growth of the city, and when we, I mean, all the infrastructures uh, arrived, like the train and the natural extension of the city, um, the infrastructures, infrastructures started gaining a stronger role. So the rivers started to be forgotten and left uh, apart. And also probably because of the repeated tragic stories of the floods at the, that happened until the end of the seventies. So time after time with all these situations, uh, the city ended up really giving the back to its four rivers. So today, this is the situation of, of these rivers that what's interesting is that each of them has a very different character, um, which for the, this reason, at a certain moment, the government thought that this could be actually a kind of pilot, um, a kind of ideal test that could then be used for developing like master plants in other cities that had this kind of um, different river situation. So, um, so then, I mean, the strategy of the project um, was to set some kind of um, global strategies combined with um, very kind of um, specific actions, but looking for this kind of uh, permeability of the city of Girona. So at the end, we understood that the, the rivers were giving a kind of opportunity to give continuity to the green spaces and blue, uh, blue infrastructure, green and blue infrastructure, uh, which connected the city with its natural surrounding. Again, as I was saying, for example, this is the how we were mapping the one of the main ones rivers, which is the third one, which is the territorial one. And here we see how, again, with this continuity of the green and blue infrastructure, we're combining this kind of global strategy to the kind of more focused and specific actions. Just setting a kind of um, ideal and systematic, um, systematic, we were trying to give a system actually of the different possible situations that could happen so that these uh, situations could be applied to solve kind of different conditions of and specific actions. And so for example, this is an example of the um, 
renaturalization of the Uña River, where we develop more deeply, and we were we applying this kind of systematization that I was showing before. And just some views of kind of the results or the opportunities that actually this master plan was kind of exploring. So now I'll start with these four, I don't remember if it's four or five competitions. The first one is the Olympicopolis. Olympicopolis um, was a competition that we won in 2015, a competition that we joined forces with Allies and Morrison and O'Donnell Tomei. And it was about um, building the new cultural district um, at the Olympic Park in Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in, in London. So the um, this is the site, this is the plot, the, the Olympic Stadium. So the Town Hall of London is uh, was the one that was leading, is leading actually, um, the as a client, but then uh, it was joining forces again with different institutions that would be building their their own equipment so um a part half of the program half of the brief was residential and the other half was cultural um so victorian albert museum sandler l wells east london college of fashion and bbc would be setting their new kind of equipment or museums or theaters in this site and in here then, uh, with this combination of partners, let's say, uh, one of the challenges or one of the aims of the project was how to combine the kind of common ground between all of them and the specificity or the particular, the specific of each of them. And we understood that maybe materiality was the opportunity or gave this kind of uh, way of uh, responding to this challenge where we would be all working with brick, but each of us would be kind of, uh, each of the institutions could be working with the material in a singular or specific way. And this is a view of, uh, coming from F10, F10 bridge is the bridge that is connecting Westfield with the stadium. So this is just in front of the aquatic center of Zahahari. Um, and so if at one of the edges of the plot, we had this more representative and singular entrance on the other side, we aim to connect in a more domestic way to the neighborhood of Hagnick Wake. So this is another one of the views coming and approaching the, the site from Hagnick Week. And these are some pictures of now, I mean, this master plan is under construction and these are some pictures of the works on site. Um, the next one is an invited competition in Berlin. Um, the, um, the competition was about building a new housing scheme in a, an, one of these kind of, this is very common in Berlin. In Berlin, there's these kind of big blocks and then you discover this kind of hidden spaces in like the hoffs, no, in the inside of, of these blocks. So the plot is just in this position, which is just inside of one of these kind of big blocks of, of the center of Berlin. So we are just next to the new Neue Gallery and the Bauhaus just next to the Luzo buffer uh, canal. And there is just one only access from to the plot from the canal, which is this small passage, just uh, next to the these blocks, which are from the eight from one of these Eva blocks from from the eighties. And also in just in the other side of, of the plot, there was this piece of industrial heritage that also we wanted to take into account. Um, so if we usually approach architecture in terms of volume, so with this idea of fulfilling the urban space, 
in this context, we thought that instead of approaching this way, we could start thinking about uh, the empty space. So thinking more about the void rather than the full filled volume. So we start shaping the, the void. So in this floor, in this diagram, we see these are the five existing blocks of the 18th, and this is the plot. So we start, rather than thinking of the built volume, we start thinking about what we're shaping here, which is this empty space in between the existing buildings and the new ones. So four curves generate four empty spaces. So a little bit like in this film, in the film Blow Up, the unit and the repetition are combined, setting a kind of rhythm, the sequence that reduces the perception of the deepness of the existing space. So these four corps for each and every stair core, offering an easy way founding to the entrances uh, to each of the blocks. So this is a view just from we have that small passage on the right. So from this first entrance, you could easily way, find your way home just until the end of, of the passage. So again, here we were testing with um, this kind of modeling strategy and trying to find a precise shape of these four curves. Actually, um, in Germany, it's uh, the system of regulations were quite differently than in here. So if here we have this, as I was saying in the previous projects, we have this very kind of strict and tight regulations about the distances and the heights. In there, it's more about um, the relation of shadows between neighbors. So here to find a precise geometry of these four curves was not also was not just about testing you know in the models which was the one that was working best but also this kind of very mathematical and precise exercise of finding this shape between the section and the distance to the neighbors trying to offer the, the kind of maximum distance or view distance to the neighbors in front so looking at the, if we look at the floor plan, the floor plan, as I said, it's organized in these four corps, which are four cores that house um, or give access to kind of four dwellings, each, each of them. And all of the um, dwellings are kind of having the double orientation south, all of them facing south. So we were combining different typologies. On the ground level, we were having duplex uh, for families with house uh, with gardens. And then on the upper levels, we were setting very small studios for actually they were the, the user was described as like young business men or woman. Um, so the, the facade, the north facade, this is a facade that's facing the existing EVA blocks. It's actually responding to this kind of typology condition of the double duplex, uh, the double level um, on the two first floors and then the studios on the following ones, on the upper ones. Always having kind of these uh, big windows on the spaces with the cores of the stairs and then uh, small winter gardens to, to receive. And then the south facade actually uh, is the one that was facing this uh, industrial uh, pump piece of heritage, which is built uh, in bricks. So the strategy was about giving this kind of glossy, lazy materiality that merged perfectly in this kind of brick materiality of the existing uh, buildings and a view of, of one of the dwellings looking the chimney, um, using this kind of winter garden again with this kind of double facade that um, helped to deal with this kind of thermic comfort for the inside spaces. This, this competition is actually the last that we've won together with Emilio Tuñón 
um, the competition in this case was about a new parking and extension of the hospital of Tortosa. So as I said before, the city of Tortosa can be read as this kind of overlap of fortifications and city walls that have been built along uh, of the year. And in here, the urban question was again, not easy. I mean, it was about solving the void that's located just in between the platform, a very high platform of the existing hospital and the last blocks of the Ensanche, which are in a lower level of, of the city. So, um, I would say that in, in this case, we were facing a space with several layers of history as we had on one side, the, the wall of the city, the Baluarte, the Las Creus, but also on the lower level, there was what is called the Hemingway space, which used to be a civil war bomb shelter, which also needed to be preserved. So the proposal here tries to give a kind of very effective response overlapping an underground stepped, an underground stepped car park and a generous park on top, which is organized as a sequence of spaces of ramps and platforms offering a new urban landscape to, to the city. So the parking is organized according to a system of platforms served serve from a double ramp. So in this way, the, the hospital platform, which is at top, is connected with the urban grid level, which is down on the below. And the new car park is sheltered under this system of ramps and platforms um, on which a garden is arranged and in a very natural way. So the encounter of the urban grid with the geological structure and the historical walls of the, of the bastion is kind of solved with this kind of landscape strategy. And this is a view from this park and hospital extension from the urban, from the Ensanche, so from the lower part of, of the city. And this is a view from the one of the upper level of, of the park. And at the end here, we were facing complexity and this complexity of the context and with the urban, the topographic and the functional constraints with this double landscape and infrastructural condition, always with a radical respect for the history of this place. Another competition also joining forces with Emilio Tuñón was the Carmen Thyssen Museum uh, in San Feliu de Guixols. So in this case, the site is located in the historical center of the city next to the medieval quarter um, with sea views and surrounded by gardens. So I would say that it's a kind of very Id idyllic uh, setting. And the competition was about the recovery of a heritage piece such as the monumental complex of the monastery, together with Porta Ferrada, the church, the palace uh, of the abbot and the gardens. So in its origin, the, the origins of the monastery started in the 10th century with Porta Ferrada, and it lays on the ancient structures of the Roman period. The monastery actually was built in different construction phases until the 18th century, which ended up like what we're seeing here. So it, at the end, it remained as a four story in this L shape. Like, um, but I think that, I mean, you can hint at the a cloister. So you can really read that the main intention was what we're seeing on the left. So it was about completing this cloister, but probably they couldn't do it because of the hardness or and difficulty of the rock, rocky terrain and topography. So the cloister ended incompletely. Then the main principle of the proposal was about recovering the cloister of the original building. The idea of a square that defines a central void is recovered, recognizing the natural position of the cloister that was never completed. 
and closing or completing the circulation on the perimeter. The cluster, which is at the ground level, becomes a public space that offers a clear relationship between the museum and the kind of museum circulations, but also with the gardens that are in the higher levels um, behind the monastery. So the recovery of the cloister as an empty space at the end opened up a new wall of possibilities of how this new space could be used and how to relate with the gardens. Um, so we were thinking about events like workshops, concerts, our uh, outdoor exhibitions, open air, whatever, site specific art. At the end, the aim was that the cloister became a space in which to integrate art as a tool of transformation and social cohesion. And at the end, this new versatile space deals with this question of scale that I was mentioning before. So it looks for a volumetric balance between the scale of the monastery, monastery on our left and the scale of the landscape and the gardens on, that we can see on, on our right. So at the same time, the new cluster becomes the topographic connection with the garden, emphasizing the character of a forest with a kind of continuity with, we actually, we call it the, the forest of columns as a new space of shade. A museum with um, this kind of inside and outside spaces, an indoor outdoor tour where the visitors experience oscillates, um, oscillates um, between the landscape, the nature, the art and the heritage. And just very quickly, the last competition, uh, just to end up with this kind of series of work that we've gone through, which is an invited competition in, in Bitburg for a new law court. So in this case, um, the plot was uh, in a neighborhood which is uh, mostly residential, but very close to the center. So we understood that the main challenge of, of the competition, not just about the, the complexity of what I said before of a low court brief, but uh, the question of scale of, of setting or, or overlapping this big new equipment into a kind of small scale residential uh, neighborhood. So this strategy was about kind of unfolding um, the, the program in this kind of uh, three slides, which um, on one of the sites was solving all the kind of uh, very functional issue, which is the access of the prisoners and the staff. But on the other side was opening up this uh, public space and gi gave access to the visitors and, and other kind of um, users. So um, on the one hand, this strategy about sliding or kind of unfolding the, the volume, but on the other side, working with the section with this kind of double steep roof that also let us um, play a bit with the perception of the height and the volume of, of the element of the building. So here we see a bit the configuration and, and the main entrance uh, to the new law courts of Bitburg. And I could, I don't know how we are on time. I mean, I could end here, but I just, well, I maybe can have a very short word um, about something that uh, we think it's super important, well, super important, I don't know how to say it. I mean, I think that in the studio, we have always tried to combine um, theory research with um, our work as, as architects. Um, so we've, I mean, we've uh, done, we've developed our research through teaching at universities, but also uh, researching with our PhDs and also through a project that we call BERS. So I've just, I'm just going to run very, very quickly, just a very quick note about the PhD um, that I did um, with the Department of History of Architecture. 
And, and this project uh, that we call BERS, that we are currently developing in, in our studio. Because at the end of the day, we really understand that theory and application are kind of two poles that enrich each other. So the, the issue about uh, my PhD research was about the German section at the International Exhibition of 1929, which um, was a project by Mies van der Rohe and Lili Reich. Uh, Mies and Lili received the commission of the German section and the German pavilion. Probably you all know the German pavilion here in Barcelona, but you have to know that the German pavilion was a very, very small part of the of the hall of, of the commission that Mies van der Rohe and Lili Reich received. Apart from the pavilion, there were 16 square meters of exhibitions spread and placed in very different buildings and showing very different um, objects. So they were exhibit, I mean, they were showing from a nail, from a toy to a plane or, or a train or, or a printer. Um, so the main challenge of me is and, and oh, wow. so the main the main challenge of me and Ray was was how to achieve a unitary outcome to give coherence but also an image to the German section. I don't know. This is uh, this picture is the picture that they the office that they had here in Barcelona, because I mean, they were working from the distance from Berlin, but they said this office just in Carre Balmes, so it's just very close. Um, and to achieve this challenge, Mies and Reich set a clear strategy of project. So they set a kind of promenade or they understood the, the project as a kind of promenade uh, through different spaces that were showing the different industrial sections where each and every fragment was part of the overall of the German section. But what's mm, most amazing about this project, I would say, is how Lily Reich, she had a wide experience on exhibitions. And I guess that Mies um, went deeply into Reich's wall, uh, in, in her world through this project and had the chance to walk on the border of the dis discipline. So he explored and experimented how to approach architectural issues with, without any presumption. So without height, without permanence, without the heaviness. And when he then went back and faced again the conventional architectural questions, his point of view had already changed. So presumptions were gone. And then he suddenly makes a step forward on the history of architecture. And with just this, this idea of the importance of walking on the border of the discipline, we started this project that we call BERS, which at the end is just about sharing knowledge with different disciplines. So what we do is we set um, some issues, some themes, which has to do with the creative processes. And we open the conversation and dialogue with two, with three or four different um, people of different disciplines. And we just share the knowledge and open, you know, our minds. So we are setting this kind of different conversations and then we are kind of crystallizing them in these magazines, in these fanzines, which can be downloaded for free in, in, in the website. So you are all invited, you know, to, to explore and, and share this, this project and discover thoughts about different issues, which are from language, from uh, artisan, no, artisan is silent. So there are different many subjects that have been discussed with different um, people from different disciplines. And all of this is shared on our Instagram. So this is a kind of publicitary end. So anyway, thank you so much to all of you. And now we are open to any questions or, or doubts that have 
may arise. Well, thank you very much, uh, Olga and Josep, of course. Uh, it's, it has been an amazing lecture. And also, uh, I love uh, all these polyedric visions of uh, not only architecture, landscape, materiality, uh, research, and, uh, and all these kind of things that uh, you are developing your, your job. So thank you very much for this uh, polyedric view of the architecture and their environment that I think that, um, of course, is necessary to have all this, uh, all this uh, open, open mind and open vision for all of all of this. I want to to say that just a comment and a question uh, really quickly, because I have the feeling when I when I have been, I have been visiting many of your buildings, especially in Tortosa, because I have been there many times. So <laughs> and are amazing. So congratulations. And um, when I see what, your your lecture, okay, I have the feeling that you um, uh, that you love like like uh, like uh, your building as an object, okay, and then uh, this object you work in different layers. No, there is one layer about the juxtaposition with environment. No, you you. Except one or two examples, okay, you never talk about the environment. So it looks like that you are trying to find like a juxtaposition or like a creating a, a distortion with the environment or something like that, no? Creating this new piece and also with the with the enclosure of with the facades or the, with the materials of the, your new buildings, no? Because at the end we have seen that in many of your buildings you are trying to. to uh, use different materials, okay, in, in the facades. You, so there is a, a constantly research about these materials in the facade, and uh, and also the relationship with interior and exterior. No, this this layer that you have this opacity, these translucent uh, elements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, how do you feel that people feels or you feel uh, that your your buildings uh, runs with the environment? And with the relationship of the materiality and, and this uh, juxtaposition, if you are looking for it or, or, or not, you're just creating an object that uh, you are agree with the fold and, and, and the enclosure. Uh, what do you think about it? Well, um, I have to say that from the very beginning, um, we've had a kind of it's not a methodology, but it's a process of project that kind of repeats once and again, I would say, and which consists on we actually deeply um, analyze the context. We, you know, we we kind a little bit like archaeologists try to uh, find uh, like uh, traces or you know because we think it's super important to kind of have a sense of belonging of of the place so on one hand we we have this strategy of working in parallel you know with different issues so at the same time we are kind of analyzing or having this kind of deep uh research about the history and the context you know and all of the knowledge that the site already have uh on in parallel we work super deeply maybe on the table next you know to the one that's analyzing this uh, we are working with typology you've seen that i haven't explained it very deeply but there's this kind of session about the grids and the order and you know the, the internal logics of of the structure and the order um of each of of the of the buildings and then there's this other question of materiality and systems or technique that I would say that over runs all the projects. So it's, you know, so there's this kind of maybe different tempo. I mean, there's this specificity of the site, there's the specificity of the typology or the brief, but then there's, I would say another kind of way of research that goes maybe and overflies all the projects, which is this idea and has to do a lot about this idea that I was telling about the Verso Reverso, which is, which, is, yes. <laughs> yeah, which, which is this kind of how we relate inside and outside and how this is built up with these systems that at the end what works better is this work of dry layers 
that kind of, I don't know if I've answered the question or if you want to add. Yeah, yeah, no, no, there, thank but, you very much. And, no, no. and they are, I, I think it's a work in parallel that they overlap. And I think that in every and different project, it, it gets a different intensity. So in some projects, maybe the intensity is more about the typology. In other ones, maybe it's the site. For example, we haven't explained the abscess square. I've just shown a, a picture very quickly, but that was site 100%, I would say, no? <laughs> so it's nice to see how, you know, with this kind of methodology that we usually don't explain, but how each of these, you know, in, in this different process, each of them takes a role and, and a different strength or intensity, you know? Thank you very much. Uh, I um, uh, now, uh, as you know, today we have uh, your microphones. You you can turn on, and if someone wants to say some questions, I'm not gonna read any questions because you have the microphone. So please go directly to turn on your microphone and, and uh, ask a question or do a comment or whatever. In any case, Ricardo, I give you uh, the word. Okay. And let's see if someone wants to say something or to ask something. Thank you very much. There are any questions? Someone, someone wants to say something? When people write, uh, they, they write more. Yeah. <laughs> Easier to write than to yeah. It's more easy to write than to, to ask. <laughs> Let's see if someone wants to say something. Maybe they couldn't write. No, they couldn't write today. Uh, ah, okay. No, well, as, yeah, there is, uh, no. no. No, they don't have the possibility because other days they have like uh, questions, uh, uh, answers and questions, but today they, they, there is not this possibility. So I don't know if someone wants to say something. If not, uh, well, I want to say you thank you very much. Okay, it has been a really good lecture and a pleasure to, to hear you about your work, especially. So, uh, Ricardo, uh, Ricardo, nice your turn. And uh, just remember <laughs> you that next week we have Un Arquitectos from Brazil. Okay, so Ricardo, uh, what you no, want? Maybe, maybe I would like you to add some comments about the, the title of the the lecture I think is so relevant, no? This this kind of relationship between what is outdoor, what is indoor. But for me, it's more interesting all that you were mentioning related with the context, no? And, and I, I am been realizing in, during the course in the visiting unit how much important is reading this kind of context, but how is appropriate and encourage the project into the context itself. No? And in that sense, it's quite interesting because finally your, your architecture from the upside is quite opaque, it's quite without a scale, but when you're inside, you are very well framing what is happening around the big surrounding. No? So in that sense, it's, I think it's quite connected. This, this idea of verso reverso mm. and, and how to deal with the context in a very different manner, no? because it's, I was thinking it's not just exactly what Kenneth Franto was pointed out in terms of regional criticism or how to deal with the, with the context only in the cultural way, you are more profound in the, in the way you are rooting your architecture in the, in the side, no? adding many, many layers of information, relationships and, and this stuff. No? Yeah. So um, I think it's very fundamental questions to, to think, no? because finally in architecture always we are enclosing indoor spaces, but this spaces is with no other options to be related with the near, uh, nearby context. No? Yeah. So I think it's, it's not a question, but it's, I, I thought it was very, very nice to, to introduce these, these three, let's say, parameters, which architecture, or well, least use architecture is, is dealing with. Uh, what was the question, uh, Ricardo? No, 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 it's not ah, no, no, the question. It was a, yeah. a comment, no? But, but yeah, it could be, probably could be a question. So how do you suggest that in, in our case now, no, with the, our students, how they could deal with this kind of version reverso? Um, and how mm. they could be, no, have this kind of two vision of the same uh, object we are producing when we are designing architecture? 
do you mean in in our unit in the yeah in our unit one? because it's an, it's an special because I think I mean this is something that can be read very subtle but as I said before there was a, a project which is the Four River Master Plan that really made us change our view of how we were approaching cities in and and this I haven't explained it but then when we went i mean at that moment we were thinking with the, uh, this house uh, the san cugat one and and the caldas one which has this more atomized project um program and actually we relate we, we realized how different uh, it was to think about the cities when you were thinking about the natural system so you know instead of thinking from from the from the um, urban grids toward the natural system, to think about the city from the natural grid toward the urban city, it made a completely difference. And probably it was, the, it was the key point to make them compatible, you know, and to balance their existence. And suddenly we started to think about architecture in that way. So we started to think, what happens if we think about these voids about these gardens about rather than you know and how you perceive these gardens from the inside and how you inhabit from the inside to the outside so i i didn't explain it you know properly maybe but it made it a change for us not only about thinking about cities but also on our approach to architecture and maybe that's we propose this um theme for the unit because sometimes thinking, you know, out of your, <laughs> how you are usually approaching architecture, you just discover other ways of approaching it and makes a big difference for the following and next steps on your career or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's the aim is not so much maybe about thinking about a version reversal literally in the, when we're thinking about architecture in this exercise, but probably about how this is going to, you know, give them another way of approaching to landscape architecture and all of this. I don't know if I've answered it properly, but. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, 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 I guess you, you did. No, that we, we also were talking about that, no, in the, in the visiting unit, how much interesting is when you are starting analyzing a context, you already are designing the project. Exactly. And I think it's something very relevant and, and a different way to understand the architecture that used to be analyzing in order to understand, let's say, the cultural issues, but not to have for having this, having or taking decisions for design the, the final object. No? Mm. And I think also in your, in your, for instance, the Berlin project, I realized it, that you were dealing with that and many other projects you were coming on right now, was also this kind of lecturing the understand in the context and but immediately you were taking decisions for your design no? yeah. and you think it's so so interesting for our students to realize that uh, it's not an um, a phase you need to accomplish rather than it's you already started the project when you are approaching to the, exactly. to the context no? good good right so well thank questions? you so much no, please no, <laughs> no I... there is some other some ones, more comments, questions. Not. Okay. Okay. So, um, no, so, so thank you so much again, Olga and Josep. Amazing okay. lecture, and see you on Friday. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> see you on Friday. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you very much, and see you soon. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.